Here are Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Exodus as we continue going through the Ten Commandments, come to the uh, Sixth Commandment. Last, last week we started to look at the second table of the law, which were Commandments 5 to 10. The commandments that deal with our interaction, our duty towards our neighbour. And last time we looked at the fifth commandment, honour thy father and thy mother. And I trust that has spurred you on this week to honour in your parents. Maybe you've called them when you wouldn't may, may not have other than wise. And uh, we come to the sixth commandment. There's just two words in Hebrew. If anyone's got a Hebrew Bible and want to follow it along, just two words. Lo ratzak. Ro, lo ratzak. You shall not murder. I'll come back to the importance of that word. You shall not murder. Ratzak. But before we read the Ten Commandments together, and then consider verse 13, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord our God, just hear the, we pray that we'd hear the promise of Jesus who said that the Father would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on the reading and the preaching of your words. Pour, upon the, the, pour out the Holy Spirit on everyone here that the truth of your law, as it shows us ourselves, but it points us to Jesus, might be known and tasted and felt its transforming, sin-exposing, Christ-exalting, life-shaping power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll just read verse 13, actually. Exodus 20 and verse 13. You shall not murder. It's probably the shortest reading you'll hear from me. But we give thanks to the Lord for these holy and inerrant words. I'm not at all a fan of the theology of Pope John Paul II, and neither do I want to be quoting him. But he was right when he said, when John Paul II said, our culture is a culture of death. And it's always stuck with me that we live in a culture of death. Give me a couple of examples to justify why I believe that's true. A gentleman called Vincent Canby, writing for the New York Times in 1990, said, describe the way that death and brutality is now used in Hollywood. And he said that if you have the impression that movies today are bloodier and more brutal than in the past, you're absolutely right. Inflation has hit the action movie with a big slimy splat. Modern action movies don't require that the audience is able to read, as do silent movies, or even reason as conventional talkies, they invoke only gut feelings. Pain and terror does not need to be understood, merely enjoyed. So just think about the, the, the solemnity of that statement, that pain and terror does not need to be understood, merely enjoyed as entertainment. If you look at the two groups who were protesting yesterday, the Defence League on one side and you know, some, some of the more um, extreme of the others. You see, pain and terror is not even understood. It, it's, it's supposed to be provoking. It's supposed to be entertainment. And it's almost like people, you know, we are watching shock, horror and awe just for entertainment's sake. The casual portrayal of murder and violence is an essential, almost, unremarkable part of daily life. Or about the realm of moral philosophy. Um, quite a lot of times people, when quote, re, uh, preaching on the Sixth Commandment, will quote Dr. Peter Singer. And he's the professor of bioethics at Princeton University. So he's, you know, he, he's a clever guy, he's a doctor, he's looked up to, and he says... Can we justify attributing equal value to all human lives while at the same time attributing to human life a value that is superior to animal life? And he says it's false, the Christian perspective on human dignity. And he concludes that the only credible option is that we abandon the idea of equal value of all humans replacing it with a graded view where moral status depends on cognitive ability. Which is a shocking thing to say. 
an absolute shocking thing to say. I saw something, I think it was only in re recent years, that Down syndrome will soon be a thing of the past. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing. My sister has a Down syndrome child. Imagine say, 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 saying that to her. And the, the, this graded view that, you know, that um, moral status depends on some kind of cognitive ability. If one has the cognitive capacity scoring high enough on a graded scale, then one may be recognised as morally valid and valuable as a human being. That is a professor in a university. He should be in prison, not, in, not, not teaching. But he's teaching ethics at one of the biggest universities in the world. And those who are cognitively impaired, so in the view of the moral philosophers, whether as the result of a, a condition or a disease or accident, should not be seen as intrinsically valuable human beings with the rest of society. An unborn child, similarly, therefore doesn't meet Professor Singer's criteria for human validity, which means that people without moral consequence or inference of guilt can be managed, used, controlled, killed and discarded. Which is, this is evil beyond words. And if you think that is only academic, Look at the abortion stats just for a moment to see how effective that kind of thinking is. In a nation that arrests people for praying outside abortion clinics, 200,000 abortions a year, 8.7 million abortions since 1967, we do live in a culture of death. And if rightly against the evil of, of abortion, Christians must be for adoption. We've been adopted into the family of God. So ours is a culture to which the prohibition of the sixth commandment speaks a word of hope. A word of hope that dignifies human life and calls us to cherish it, nourish it, nurture it, wherever it is found. I look at it, I'm going to do it a certain, coming in a certain way today. I'm going to end on pointing us to the dignity and of human life. Because sometimes the truth of God's word, we should really just revel in. We should revel in it. And uh, I don't want to end with a to-do list in any shape or form. But I want to look briefly at the beginning what the sixth commandment does not prohibit and what it uh, does prohibit before turning to the theological foundation which, in which we should hope. Because above all, preaching, gospel preaching is about hope. And hope is not found in us. Hope is found in Jesus. We can rest, the eternal rest of the soul. So first of all, I said at the beginning, thou shalt not murder is two words in Hebrew. There's two words, lo ratzak. It seems uncontroversial. The world has a problem with keeping the Sabbath. Christians have a problem with keeping the Sabbath. But no one really has a problem with thou shalt not murder. If you went out and asked people in the street, are you for murder? I hope no one would say yes. But if you, if you, followed up, if you had a follow-up question, why is murder wrong? I bet you would get 99% a utilitarian kind of, some kind of, some kind of wishy-washy kind of status. It's the way things work. You can't have people walking around murdering people. So, well, why is murder wrong? It's when we come to the biblical ethic that we have more than a utilitarian sense that it just makes sense. We can't have people walking around killing each other, except unless you live in London where they do it all the time. But with a, with a Christian worldview, we understand that each, by being virtue of the made in the image of God, we have worth and dignity. That's why we're made in the image of God. We have inherent worth and dignity. No matter your race, no matter your ethnicity, as we see anti-Semitism at levels it hasn't been since the Holocaust, no matter your race, no matter your ethnicity, no matter how you vote, no matter your health, no matter your disability, no matter your age, no matter your infirmity, no matter whether you like the person or not, 
by virtue of being made in the image of God, ought, they ought to have life. By virtue of being made in the image of God, they ought to have life. Men and women have life because they're made in the image of God. End of. So what does the sixth commandment prohibit? Well, it prohibits the taking of innocent life. Thou shalt not murder, lo rat sack, is a different word to thou shalt not kill. Because the word for kill, chalal, is used hundreds of times in the Old Testament. But murder, lo rat sack, is, much, is used much more sparingly. So the word in the sixth commandment, is doesn't, it does not say in Hebrew, thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder, lo rat sack, not chalal. And uh, that's an important. So there are instances where the taking of a human life is lawful. The sixth commandment does not prohibit self-defence. Exodus 22, verse 2, if a thief is found breaking in and is struck so he dies, there is no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall pay. If he has nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. So if, you, if it's dark, the, the, what that is saying is very simple. If it's dark and you kill an intruder in self-defence, you're not to be blamed. But if the sun is up, like if you shoot someone in the back, basically what this is saying, and you had a recourse to do it another way, then it is guilty. Capital punishment. The sixth commandment does not prohibit capital punishment. Genesis 9 verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Now, you can debate, and Christians do, whether capital punishment is carried out fairly, or whether our judicial system has the capacity to, to carry it out with integrity. Christians do disagree on those points. But what we see from Scripture is that capital punishment is provided for, not as an affront to the image of God, but because of our belief in the image of God. It is because human life is precious that the taking of human life is treated so seriously. Just war. On this day, Remembrance Sunday, we have to affirm that the Old Testament does not prohibit war. God sends Israel into battle. God fights on behalf of his people. The New Testament does not demand pacifism. Romans 13 verse 4. 4. The one in authority is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. When Jesus addressed the woman caught in adultery, he said, go and sin no more. He did not say to the centurion, go and sin no more. Because just by being a centurion in the Roman army, wasn't in somehow sinful or ungodly. And if you follow Jesus, you leave the army behind. The sixth commandment does not prohibit every form of killing, but the sixth commandment prohibits intentional murder, the unlawful taking of an innocent life. And what that includes, it includes suicide. Our own life as, as well as the life of others. The Sixth Commandment prohibits suicide. That's a painful topic, especially painful for anyone who has been affected with family or a friend. But I'm saying this theologically. This is it's not the way that I would lead in a pastoral moment. Because you weep with those who weep. You weep with those who weep. But it is fair to say what the Bible says about suicide, that it is a sin. Now there may be extreme cases where the suicidal person has lost, lost sight of their faculties. But in the vast majority of cases we see suicide as a morally culpable choice. For centuries it was the church's understanding on suicide. But today it is celebrated as courageous. And that's what we should speak against. Because the Bible says that even that self-murder is murder. There are five instances of suicide in the Bible, all in shame and defeat. Abimelech, Saul, Ahithophel, Zimri, and Judas. The five um, instances of suicide in the scriptures. 
where, more, where, more, where other characters ask God to take their lives, God never obliges Moses, Elisha, Job and Jonah. And in the case of Job and Jonah, God regards their self-destructive respect request unfavourably. Abortion, secondly, Psalm 139, verse 13, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. And the church until very recently has spoken universally against abortion. And societies, in society in the early church, it wasn't thought unseemly to kill children in the womb. It was the Christian church with their Jewish heritage that had an elevated, honoured place for children. John Calvin says, for the fetus, it, although in the womb of its mother is already a human being, it's a monstrous crime to rob it of the life which it has not yet begun to enjoy. Life begins at conception. I think we have to affirm that. It's not a religious opinion, in my opinion. It's a scientific fact. Life begins at conception. And I think the sixth commandment, thirdly, just to say before we get into the theological reasons, is it prohibits euthanasia, mercy killing. Di diagnoses are imperfect. They are imperfect. And we've seen enough people who've been thought to be in a coma come back to life to know that that is the case. So we're to do whatever we can to preserve human life. Now, there is a profound difference between termination of treatment and termination of life. I have to say that. Um, many have opted for the termination of treatment and not unbiblically in my opinion. I don't need to be hooked up to this ventilator. I don't need to take another round of chemo. That's a termination of treatment, but euthanasia is the termination of life. And it can only operate with an understanding of the human person which violates our worth and dignity made in the image of God. And over time, voluntary euthanasia often, usually becomes involuntary. What starts off as voluntary becomes involuntary. What, what starts out as supposedly an act of compassion becomes involuntary because that person is convinced, well, I'm a burden to the NHS, I'm a burden to my family. Carry on being a burden to the NHS. But there's, there's a law in the Netherlands, for example, the more requests to end life come from family pet members than the patient. And during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, for example, Dutch physicians, Dutch doctors refused to carry out the Nazis' orders to kill elderly and terminally ill patients. But in 2001, 2001, some time ago now, Holland was the first country to give legal status to doctor-assisted suicide. Malcolm Muggeridge said, one generation, one generation transformed a war crime to an act of compassion. But Psalm 41, verse 1, Blessed is the one who considers the weak in the day of trouble the Lord delivers him. Every human being has worth and honour. Whether they can walk and run or jump or not, whether they can speak or not, whether they have a burst in IQ or not, whether they're young and healthy or old and ageing. And I'm towards the young and, you know, never, never mind. But it's, it's, it's the same worth, same worth. It's not on a, on a sliding scale. You don't become less worthy as you get older. You're not less worthy when you're younger. Same worth made in the image of God. And those who are weak deserve special care. They're not burdens. The old are not burdens. Children are not burdens. To provide comfort, help and care throughout their lives, however long God would give them to live. We have an opportunity to show something different as Christians on how we understand the human person and we will not murder, whether they're in the womb or whether they're old and aged, whether they're thought to be worth little or whether they're depressed and discouraged, we will value human life. Today we will value human life. But Jesus transforms the sixth commandment. In Matthew 5 verse 22, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. John writes 1 John 3 verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The level of discourse of the world today is hateful. You don't have to spend more than five minutes on social media to see how nuts people are. The hate, and, w and when you hate, it leads to murder. The root as well as the fruit is forbidden. The reach of the sixth commandment extends to our hearts, not just the actions of our hands. The sixth commandment is a radical commitment to the welfare of our neighbour. And it calls us to self-sacrifice. It calls us to care for the good of all people. I want to show you three principles behind the sixth commandment. The dignity of human life. The depravity of human life, but the destiny. Three simple ideas. These are the foundations of the which the Sixth Commandment rests on. This is what gives the Sixth Commandment its force, its urgency, its power. The dignity, the depravity, the destiny of human life. First of all, the dignity. The Sixth Commandment presupposes that human life is marked with a unique dignity and essential value. Genesis 1 verse 27 which I read at the beginning, says that we are made in the image of God. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Quite a, apart from any gifts we possess, quite apart from our cognitive ability, all people are created equal in dignity and value because we're the image bearers of Almighty God. The likeness of the Creator shines in the features of the least and the lowest. The destitute and the diseased, the homeless, the infirm, the elderly, the infant, the unborn, they are formed by God's hand and are redolent of their Maker. God says, Genesis 9 verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall for his blood be shed. The sixth commandment therefore teaches us that murder is a sin because it is an assault on the dignity of a human being that is made in the image of God. James, the brother of our Lord, connects the violation with the sixth commandment following the teaching of the Lord Jesus in the, the um, Sermon on the Mount, when we misuse our speech in our anger and resentment, we wound one another. He shows us that murder is sin and points us to the fact that when we misspeak, we're doing injury to the image of God in our neighbour. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. It is a rebuke to our profanity, our anger and our resentment. It is that same spirit, our malicious tone, our use of profanity, our hateful speech, our passive aggressive manipulation does not avoid the condemnation of the sixth commandment. The people that we belittle, look down our noses on, the people that we think we are better than because they don't do things the way that we do them. Those that we abuse, those that we uh, swear about, those that we mistreat. Those people that we're doing that to, they bear the stamp and the imprint of the divine likeness. You, it's not just you who bears the image of God, they do too. So your assault on them is an assault on God. And God dignifies their humanity as well as yours in his image. John Calvin said, our neighbours bear the image of God. To use him, abuse him or misuse him is to do violence to God. 
the dignity of human life. God has, God has stamped human beings with his image so that in our thoughts and our words and our works, we give respect to the image of God in other people. Secondly, the depravity of human life. The second thing to see that the sixth commandment presupposes is not just the dignity, but the depravity. Before the fall, Adam and Eve needed no transcript of the law. It's written on their hearts by nature. God told them, remember not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat it, you will surely die. And Satan said, you will surely not die. And when our first parents disobeyed God, they broke the sixth commandment, taking actions that brings death on themselves and to all human beings descending from that. I'm not sure we see that, that thou shalt not, you know, that it, it does murder and violence to the image of God. Romans 5 verse 12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. We have death because of sin. So death spread to all men because all sin. Adam's sin killed himself. And all mankind descended from him. So it's hardly surprising that the first recorded sin in scripture apart from the fall is what? Murder. Where Cain killed Abel. And if you continue to read in the Genesis account, one of the strikest features of the narrative is that depravity becomes quickly more apparent. So only six chapters in, Genesis 6 verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of sin was great, of man was great in the earth. And every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that means, among other things, that the law of God written on our consciences by nature was no longer a reliable guide and God provided for us his law, his written word, given at Sinai in tablets of stone and preserved for us in the Holy Scriptures to inform our sin-darkened consciences, to restrain the worst excesses of our depravity, to guide our, contact, our conduct as a society. We rejected God's standards. We determined the ethics of our codes by pragmatic considerations. And so we live in a culture of death. God calls us not just individually, not just as a church, but as a society to a culture of life where human dignity is preserved and honoured from the womb to the tomb. The command was given because of human dignity, but also because of human depravity, which reminds us that we need a saviour. It shows us the depravity of our hearts it shows us that we all fall short of God's glory, that we have become transgressors of his law. <clears throat> Mankind is in need of deliverance. And one function of God's law, if you, look, if you go back to the function of God's law, is to show us how much we need rescuing. We need the law because it shows us how much we need a saviour. Venom towards others comes naturally and it's seen as a good thing. There are people who set out to be venomous. The same tongues, have you seen the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of it? The same tongues that pretend to stand here and worship God. The same tongues pour venom on the image of God in other people. We stoke the fire of grudges. We nurse resentment. We take opportunities for vengeance. We set ourselves to be vengeful when we just sit here very, very piously saying, our Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We're hypocrites. Our conscience slumber contentedly in the illusion of my moral superiority until the law comes in. And the law, with all its comprehensive intensity, exposes the ugliness and the depravity of our true condition in the sight of God. There's two ways to listen to the teaching of the Ten Commandments. One is to say, yeah, I, I, yeah this applies to so-and-so. I'm thinking of so-and-so. Apply it to somebody else. The only right way to hear it is, oh God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And the most respectable are laid bare as breakers of the Sixth Commandment. We are. We are. We all break the sixth commandment. I'm a sixth commandment breaker. 
which is shocking. Murderer. Maybe not in deed, but in thought and word. So we need saving. We need a saviour outside of ourselves. The sixth commandment teaches us not just that we are dignified in the image of God, but those, so, those same human beings who are image bearers of God are depraved lawbreakers whose disobedience has distorted that image and stand in the need of deliverance. Which brings me to the last presupposition upon which the sixth commandment rests. Because the Bible holds out two destinies for all people everywhere. And one of them will be yours. That is the gospel, you see. The Bible holds out two destinies for all people everywhere. And one of them will be yours. Every person sitting in this room faces one of two final ends. Eternal life. Or eternal death. Heaven in the presence of Jesus Christ or hell where you'll be punished away from the presence of the Lord. That is the calling to the Saviour that preaching must contain. One of those will be your destiny. Job 19 verse 25 speaks of the hope of life. I know that my Redeemer liveth and at the last he will stand on the earth and after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Do you believe that? David in Psalm 118 verse 17, he sings, I shall not die, but I shall live. I shall not die, but I shall live. We are longing, Revelation 21 verse 4, for when he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. At his second coming, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Daniel 12 verse 2 gets the balance of this right. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Eternal life is the Christian's great hope. I'll always remember those words from Peter Maiden who said to me, James, when did you last preach a sermon about heaven? Because there, there is no point to anything we do. It's just plain, it's just been dumb, it's just been stupid if there isn't our eternal hope constantly presented to us. Eternal death is the warning set before the unbeliever because eternal life or eternal death describes the destiny of everyone in this world. Those who do not repent and believe in Jesus Christ will go to hell forever. So how does that relate to the sixth commandment? 1 John 3 verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So everyone who has broken the sixth commandment is going where? What's the consequences of our breach of the sixth commandment? Have you broken the sixth commandment? There's only one answer to that. You have and so have I. And what is the consequence? A lost eternity. How shall we then, those of us who have broken the sixth commandment, find that life and not death might be ours when it is death we deserve? You see the logic of that? The point of that? How shall we escape those of us who have broken the sixth commandment? And God has made a way in the death of his son. God has made a way where there seemed to be no way. Christ was murdered. He was murdered for murderers like me and you. The only one who never broke the sixth commandment was murdered for all of those of us who had. Think of Jesus bleeding and dying amid the insults and mockery of the crowd that crucified him. Think of Jesus crying, dying, 
Do you hear the piling up of the breaches of the sixth commandment? Pilate washing his hands of him. The religious leaders baying for his blood. The world is covered in darkness as the Son of God, the life giver, is murdered at the hands of the people he came to save. And what does he say? What does he say as his lifeblood ebbs away? What does he say to murderers? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. We who have broken the sixth commandment, what must we do? We must go to Jesus crucified and hear him say, Father, forgive them. I thank the Lord, and this is what we can rest in, that there's mercy for murderers at the foot of the cross. There is a pardon for you in Jesus Christ. Will you not come again? Or would you maybe come for the first time to Jesus Christ and ask for mercy, acknowledge the depravity of your heart and seek the cleansing that only Jesus can give you? Father, forgive them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you. We turn anew to Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God and he was murdered so that we might live. Would you have mercy on us that our Saviour's prayer for murderers might be true in our case. Father, forgive them. In Jesus' name. Amen.